Welcome everybody for this wonderful day in Bristol. I've come from London this morning, actually I came from Kent this morning, but uh, it's, a, it's beautiful to be in Bristol. Um, my name is David Buck and I'll be chairing this session today. Um, a little bit, so anyone, everyone familiar with Slido? Anyone heard of that? Have you got smartphones? What a surprise. So if you, if you want to put some questions to our, our guests and our speakers, if you go to sli.do, so the website, it's just a way to actually put, note your questions down as we're going to the talks. So we're going to have some clarification from the speakers, but the big debate with you and, you and them is going to wait till the end so that you can hear the different perspectives of the speakers. So Slido is a really helpful way to sort of log some questions. You can also look through questions that other people have uh, put down. And if you think that's a fantastic question, I wish I'd thought of that, you can give it a little tick and that'll send it up the election polls so that by the end of, end of the conversations, we'll know what the most um, common or, or in-depth questions or, or most, not common, but, but most popular questions are. I will, don't worry, it won't all be um, virtual. I will allow you to put your hands up and ask a question in a normal way too, but it's just a way to get you involved in the debate. So go to Slido, S-L-I.D-O, and then there's an event hashtag, which is A853. Okay, so Slido, hashtag A853, and the event today should come up there. So let us know if you've got any problems. Um, before we start, just a little bit about why I'm here. So we're talking about using evidence to advise public health decision makers and insiders. Why I'm here, um, I'm fascinated by this question myself. And I have, an, I have a sort of, um, I have also sort of a specific interest because I've been involved on, in various ways in this question over, over my career. So I have been in the Department of Health, so I've been a, a user of evidence and, and wanting to understand evidence and wanting to apply it into policy decisions, policy making, or to influence me, to influence others that I can influence. I've also been a researcher myself in public health, particularly public health and economics and health economics. So I've been a producer to some degree of evidence too. And currently, my I work at the King's Fund, for those of you who don't know, is a, sort of, is a charity and a think tank. Uh, and our job, actually, I've sort of become, from, from coming out of the Department of Health, I'm now trying to influence it and Public Health England and all the other national bodies, as well as supporting local policymakers, directors of public health, etc., on the ground. So I, I've got an interest in this question from at least three different hats. And depending on what hat I've got on, I might come, come to this in a different sort of manner. So I'm really keen to hear from our speakers today and from yourselves about how you do this and how, how, how we can be more effective. And particularly what's great if we have an insider's view. All the people today are involved in this question intimately. Public health, as you know, um, and the second thing, sorry, second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever thing says, I'm really pleased about the diversity in the audience. I had a little bit of chat over uh, tea and coffee and, and, and sandwiches, etc. What's really critical is that we have lots of different voices addressing this, and, and evidence comes from all sorts of different places. So I'm really pleased that you are from across the University of Bristol. You're not all clinicians, you're not all policy link, linkages. We, I know given we're in the law school, the law is a critical part of this. So when you leave this room, I hope that you actually talk to each other beyond it, because your contribution together to answer this question is really, really critical. So pleased to see the, the broad diversity of, of people in the room today. Um, there's no fire alarm planned. You, hopefully you walked past the toilets when you came in, but they're just around the corner. Um, I have to tell you this, this because of the period we're in, the event is subject to pre-election restrictions regarding public visibility. So particularly our colleagues from, uh, who work for government or government agencies um, may, may not be able to answer some questions, but we will be recording the event uh, to upload to YouTube after the election. Um, but please, I've been asked to ask you to refrain from using social media during the event. Having said that, please use Slido, but don't, don't do lots of tweeting, which is a bit, a bit unfortunate, but you can tweet after the event or after the election. Um, we're here from our four presenters about national, local and academic perspectives on using evidence to inform policy, and then we'll have the Q&A session, including Slido, but not just Slido, also listening to you directly. Sorry, as we are saying, public health is one of the most contested and critical policy areas. It brings together ethical and political issues and evidence on what works and affects us all as citizens 
and users of services to the extent that we use public health or, or NHS social care services. Researchers and many others produce evidence and decision makers receive advice from various sources, including researchers directly, but also various intermediaries. And I'd say the King's Fund is a sort of form of intermediary itself. And present those findings and advice to politicians and budget holders, to those making decisions nationally, but also critically locally. I think one of the most interesting things in my career that I've seen the last 10 years is just how, and you may disagree with this, and my panel members may disagree with this too, but just how much more interesting the local decision making has become. So I think more and more powers uh, have been devolved within, I'm talking within England here now, as well as to various nations of the UK, the other nations of the UK. And just actually, a, a reckon, I think I've recognised just, just how important local decisions are. We were talking earlier on about decisions that are made in this, in this city, in Bristol, by all the public services and community organisations alongside them and the connection between the university and policy making and decisions that actually happen in Bristol in the place that you all live, work and study and whether that's strong enough or could be even stronger. So that might be something we might come on to, particularly around the role of directors of public health, etc. There will use some examples, perhaps not current examples or um, given what we said about pre-election uh, issues, but I hope you have a really good day. You're going to hear from some fantastic speakers. I've only going to give them, they're only going to get about 15 minutes. My view is far more time than they should already, so I should get off the stage. My job is to introduce them and chair them, so I will now draw my role to, the, to, to a close in terms of the introduction. Can I just ask Richard Gleave to come up first? He works uh, Deputy Chief Executive and Chief Operating Officer of Public Health England, and may give a little bit more context. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm going to use my slides quite loosely. Um, and I thought I'd start by just saying a little bit about Public Health England. Um, I've got a particular interest in this because I'm doing research about public health, how Public Health England uses uh, evidence and knowledge to inform policy and practice. Uh, and there um, is very little research about how organisations actually practically take evidence and knowledge in the public health sphere and turn it into either policy, by which we probably mean formal policy statements and documents, but there are lots of views about what policy is, or, or practice, actually delivering services or delivering legal fa functions that exist. And when I go around and talk to my colleagues in, in PHE, one of the things that, that I now say, having, having listened to them, is that the thing that unites the 5,500 people working in different areas is that running through, like words running through a stick of rock, is something like using knowledge and evidence to solve real-world problems. I can be standing in a, a laboratory um, that does uh, highly specialised, unusual microbiological tests. So I can be working with the team that's thinking about public mental health challenges or designing uh, an intervention or, or a programme like Every Mind Matters. And in all of those situations, despite all the different perspectives, that is one of the things that they, they have in common. This desire to use evidence, but it's about the application of evidence. And at the Public Health England annual conference, some of you might have been there, there was a very interesting session with NIHR and NICE. Um, not really anyone from PHE speaking, actually. But, but Jill Leng, the Deputy Chief Exec of NICE, made a very important point, which was a contrast between the work that NICE do and what NIHR do. NHR will commission a lot of work and will produce uh, very important and helpful summaries of the evidence. But, but Jill said, NICE is different. We have to make a recommendation at the end of our piece of work. We can't just say there isn't enough evidence or the evidence is incomplete or uh, there's more evidence and research needed. Now, it actually has to produce a recommendation. And, and at the same time, I've been thinking, that a lot of what we do in this area has two functions, one of which is reviewing and handling evidence and knowledge, and the other one 
is giving advice. And the art of giving advice, which is in the title of the talk, is as, is as important and challenging as the skill required to review the evidence. So, and in that context, we often have these stereotypes, and um, we are in what would stereotypically be seen as an ivory tower, wouldn't we, with the, with the wheels building. And a great quotation here, David, this may echo for David, it may even be, no, it was before, you, was, you weren't in the department at this time. An academic from LSE in 2014, I was shocked at the level of interference of civil servants in the process of research. There was huge pressure to spin the findings. Um, that's, the, that's the academic stereotype about those of us who may have muckier hands sometimes. But the senior civil servant in a 2012 workshop said, we got some really high quality papers, but it always felt like they were answering yesterday's question tomorrow. <laughs> and at the same workshop, a, 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 a consultant from a hospital, I feel overwhelmed by the range of advice we get. Being frank, it now washes all over me. So you can see how those stereotypes, I think stereotypes are sometimes useful, aren't they? Because they tell us something that's quite true. And, and I think that it's very easy to sit in one of those camps. And one of the things I'm interested in my research and, and in this session is about crossing the boundaries between those sorts of, of, of camps. And as an organisation, the one that Isabel and I work for, we, we most emphatically sit in bits of all three of these stereotypes. Uh, it's, not, it's not quite as simple as trying to straddle a wall and have one foot on either side. It's a bit more difficult than that. You've got to have a third leg that, that comes out. But um, those, we have a significant number of academics that, that work for us, part-time and full-time. We sit with government ministers talking about policy issues and we go into hospitals, we go into local government, we go into community health service, we go into third sector organisations and talk to them about their practice. But those stereotypes create a sort of paradigm that implies that there's something over here called research, knowledge, evidence, and that over here we've got something that's policy and practice. And that implies that we face obstacles and barriers and gaps that sit between those things. Though Catherine Oliver, in probably the best systematic review of the, the literature around that, really challenges that stereotype. She says, so many studies just start with that mindset that there is a, a gap to be jumped across. But that has become very powerful in our thinking. So we use lots of language, you probably do, I do, that are about translation or transfer or exchange or brokerage. It implies there's something over here that has to be moved to something over here and that they are different things. And that we then start to think about how can we shape this thing here so it lands better here or how do we change what happens here so it's more receptive to what's coming across there. I want to challenge that stereotype. I think it's actually a, an obstacle to us doing really good work together that focuses around the public's health and what we ought to do. It, the stereotype leads to two sorts of uh, images that are very powerful, even if we don't articulate them. We often end up talking about something like the valleys of death where research is going along and it drops down, often for a long period of time, and doesn't get picked up. And we like to think of something that's an ecosystem where we've got evidence and knowledge busy being moved around in a sort of organic and living way, but we talk about it in such a vague way that we're not really sure what it is we should be doing in order to make that work. We just use it to describe something that sounds rather idealistic. I'm not going to go through the detail here, but there are two challenges to that. One is quite a neutral version of it, which just says we need to invest time in managing this, this interface. We accept that those two are an interface, 
They're different sorts of knowledge. There's, there's no what, which is the evidence and the academic bit, and then there's no how, which is what the practitioners have. But I want to say there's something that's actually much more critical than that, that isn't just about accepting that as it is. We need to go further. We've got to get in and think about the dynamics and power relationships that exist around the way in which we use and construct the knowledge that we have. And we've got to recognise the organisational boundaries that exist that are integral to the way in which these things play out in practice. Come back to that. I can think of two examples that, that, that are around that, that really illustrate that. And, and my suggestion is that we need to think about it in a different way. So this thing, this idea of a, of a field of where there is argument and dispute about the evidence, you absolutely recognise that and call it out and say that's really important. And at the moment, e-cigarettes is just a really interesting area of, of that. And I think it's very difficult, not just for citizens, but for many people that are working in this area to work out what is the actual evidence-informed view that we should work on. And the other one is then thinking about the, the drama. I was rereading recently uh, the, uh, a document by the Institute for Government that described how the ban on smoking in public places had been brought about. And they invited a number of the key proponents back to have a discussion, people from academia, people from the third sector, particularly for MASH as a lobbying organisation, different members of parliament and, and civil servants. And there were a number of things that, that jumped out from that. There was something about the, the different actors and how they played their role in this, in this drama. So obviously Liam Donaldson is the chief medical officer for those who can remember him as a very powerful and dominant figure. You know, we, we now know that in private a number of times he threatened to resign if, the, if a total ban on smoking in public places didn't happen. The importance of the politicians, critical moments, there was a shift in the political leadership, all within the Labour Party, but the move to John Reid being the, the Secretary of State, everyone, he was a former smoker who'd only recently stopped. There's a very famous quotation from him about, it's rather patronising, I think we'd see it now, about poor people having few pleasures in life and smoking is one of them about handling the dynamics of, of that. But what was really interesting to me, and this is where the drama analogy really helps, is behind the scenes there was a little group that met, that only became, we only know about now, after the event. Ash were integral to it. Kevin Barron, who was the uh, MP who chaired the Health Select Committee at the time, um, a number of the key lobby, uh, a number of the key agencies of government were actively involved with it, like health development agency and the like, and, and they put together, in effect, the script to move from a Labour Party manifesto, which said we'll have a partial ban on smoking in some public places, to the total ban that came in in 2007. So. I'm going to stop there to make sure we go on time. There are other things we can follow up elsewhere. But that strikes me that the model we need to have in our head, the paradigm that we need to think about, is one where we actively cross the boundaries. And, and Guston, who wrote about uh, the environmental uh, science, um, it wrote about environmental science and how organisations use evidence in that field, developed the concept back, back in the 1980s, 1990s, about a boundary organisation. And a boundary organisation starts by saying, we are in both of these two fields. And we've got to have credibility, salience and legitimacy in both of these two fields. That is a really challenging place to be. The way in which you become successful in these different fields are very, very different. To be successful in the academic field is completely different from being successful in the policy or practitioner field. But actually, we want people that step across those boundaries and that can operate in both of those. And we need ideas and language that help us to straddle those two things. That's what I hope today's session is going to help us explore in more detail. Thank you very much.
we do have just just we're going to have the proper Q and A later. But if there's any any question of clarification, happy to take that now because you've, you've you've timed it perfectly, Richard. So. Any clarification? I'm not known for timing it perfectly, so this is a first. Exactly. Uh, can you make that you can tweet reference that. for me? You can tweet <laughs> so just a, just a question here, and then we'll move, move on to um, Professor Oliver, if you don't mind. Yeah, just to clarify on that organisation, that boundary organisation, who is it you're describing with that boundary organisation? Is that an organisation or is it a group of individuals or is it a virtual community? But so, so the word organisation is an interesting word because it's both a noun and in many ways a, a, we use it as a, as a version of the verb because we talk about um, organising things in that. So um, certainly I think, and Isabel will have um, come across me talking about this before, I think that does describe what, what is interesting and challenging about being in Public Health England. So I think we are a boundary organisation but we're not the only one. And I think organisations have different boundaries, but we, the easy thing in running an organisation is to actually go to the core and to the heart, and people tend to focus and concentrate towards that. In addressing the issue that we've got today about advice based upon evidence and knowledge, I think you have to turn that round and go for the boundary and look to straddle into other areas. And that's an opportunity for academics an opportunity for practitioners and blurring that boundary the insider perspective in the title I think is, is integral to our success in the future thank you very much so we may come back to this issue later on thank you Richard and sorry to, to hold um, Isabel up so Isabel has got even long, a longer time than you so you, you're doing all sorts of um, boundaries and spanning or too many jobs another way to look at is director of research translation and innovation and deputy director of the national inspection service at public health England and Isabel is going to talk a little bit about this particular partnership between science and society thank you very much so um, I'm, uh, I'm actually research active. Uh, I collaborate with colleagues here at the University of Bristol and elsewhere. And I also uh, am responsible, uh, you know, with the other part of my job for also advising uh, policymakers. And I'm delighted to be here today because I think this is a, a really interesting topic, but also uh, very important. I think that the key to evidence-based public health is partnerships between science and society. And I decided to use the word society, thinking about, well, who are the decision makers here? And at a time particularly when we are experiencing a bit of a breakdown in trust between government and the public, um, thinking about society as uh, groups of, uh, of people uh, sharing common institutions and common culture, I thought was particularly relevant to the conversations that we were having today. Um, Looking at the list, uh, the attendance list, I see that most of you are working here at the university, uh, and I know some of you. I know you are very uh, productive. You produce lots of research outputs. Why is it that with such an abundance of uh, research, we still uh, get a lot of feedback that we don't have the evidence that we need to uh, inform public health action? Why is it, does it that it takes so long uh, to uh, implement uh, the findings of, of research or, or, or to take those forward. Uh, I think this, this question sort of, lead, they lead me to think about, well, how relevant is it, uh, uh, the evidence that, that we produce? And by relevant, if you, if you look at synonyms of the, the word relevant, you can, uh, you can find things like uh, important, uh, uh, current, uh, on point, um, and um, uh, maybe that's, that's something maybe that, that I was keen to explore a little bit um, today. Um, I think we talk about, and I, you know, Richard was referring to these as uh, stereotypes. Um, I've, I'm trying to say the same thing in a sense using the, the sort of myth of the broken system. Um, the, the, if a system is broken, then it would be fixed. So this, the system is not broken, it's just it's perfectly designed to achieve what it's trying to achieve. So in the university, you know what you're trying to achieve, and you know, governments, they, they, they know what they're trying to achieve. Um, uh, so so what, what, 
you know, what, thinking about that um, and, and the characteristics really of the kind of evidence that, uh, that we need to deal with in, in public health, uh, a, a key issue for me is timeliness of evidence in, in public health, particularly in health protection, but not exclusively. Uh, we often have to uh, take action quickly, sometimes uh, in the absence of a perfect uh, evidence base. And uh, the problem that we face sometimes is that interventions get rolled out quickly and universally and they become standard practice and we can no longer evaluate them. Uh, on the other hand, if the evidence is there, we need to assimilate it really quickly to provide that, that uh, public health advice. Uh, an example is uh, when I was involved in the Gloucestershire floods of 2007. Um, they, uh, there were a very large number of the population, as you can see there, without access to, uh, to mains water. And we had to give quickly advice about how to feed babies, how to bottle feed babies. Well, you wouldn't believe it because, you know, we had a lot of people in the sort of uh, what is called a stack in the scientific advisory sort of groups that are set up. Uh, wanting to do an evaluation of the different mineral contents of the different bottled waters. And I was sitting there thinking, but we need to tell the mothers how to feed the babies now, not in two or three days' time, let alone a month's time. Um, sometimes we find that matching the, the pace of the research to, um, uh, to what we need is challenging. For example, we did experience difficulties in, in sort of mobilizing the sort of scientific community to answer questions that needed to be answered in the context of the last flu pandemic. So, for example, should we close schools? And if you look, um, just have a look at PubMed and you'll see when the, the papers on whether public schools should be closed were published. Some are still being published now. Um, is our evidence the right evidence? Uh, so I took up uh, this post of Director of Research, Translation and Innovation in PhD a few months ago, and um, we published a new uh, strategic plan for uh, Public Health England recently. And I realized that perhaps we haven't been as good as we should be at identifying an, uh, our um, uh, evidence gaps and articulating our research needs. And I get a lot of feedback that, you know, the kind of evidence that we need to reduce childhood obesity is understanding what the impact is of advertising, but all the research seems to be going on to finding new genes associated with, uh, with obesity. Why is that? Why aren't uh, the research priorities of uh, policymakers, governments, public health community aligned to those of academia or the research funding bodies. Got my thoughts on that. <laughs> um, sometimes uh, you've all written a paper, and I'm sure, uh, you know, if I ask you now how many of you have said more research is needed in the recommendations, uh, I would expect every single uh, hand would be up in this room. Certainly mine would be. Uh, but actually, when is uh, evidence sufficient to take public health action? And uh, are we then taking forward to making sure so do, uh, one of the criticisms that's often made is that we focus on the internal validity of studies, not so much on the external validity and the implementation of, uh, uh, of that research in, in a variety of settings. Um, sometimes we need to provide public health advice when the evidence is still developing. Uh, Richard mentioned um, uh, e-cigarettes. Um, uh, the example there at the, uh, at the bottom is uh, MERS coronavirus. When we had the first cases in Birmingham a few years ago, we didn't know if the infection could be transmitted from person to person. But you have to give public health advice there and then. And the importance is, is how, do we, how do we have those conversations? Because developing trust with policymakers and being transparent is key. <coughs> but one of the challenges that perhaps you are not aware of is that uh, colleagues in, in the civil service and government move very often. So there is a sort of two-year cycle of, of promotion and movement. So by the time you've developed the relationship, you know, the person that you are dealing with is moved on and there is no organizational memory. Um, an area that interests me particularly is this one of uh, constraining or restrictive evidence. Um, the fact is that a lot of the, the real problems and challenges that we deal with at the moment are complex. Um, and um, 
uh, you know, you may not know this, but evidence-based uh, uh, policy decision-making, you know, was advocated by the Blair government, is fairly recent, and uh, this all originates from evidence-based medicine. Uh, evidence, the approach to evidence-based medicine is very much uh, designed to, for example, test new new drugs, new pharmaceuticals, and it's perfectly designed to do that. But does it meet our needs in the context of, of public health interventions? Why is it that when you have a lot of data, then it's still difficult to take action? You've got climate change as an example. The thing that I've put here that is quite interesting is that we follow a vertical approach uh, to, program, uh, to, to, to programs, in a sense, so you, you have disease-specific research programs when the reality that we experience is, is much more complex than that and issues are interdependent. This is a particular problem in the, in the voluntary sector, in charities. So this is an example of a charity I know, and they've done a lot of interesting work because they find that if you are, if you are funding programs, uh, you know, if chari when charities are being funded on a programmatic basis and on the basis of, of certain criteria for evaluation, it constrains innovation and cross-system working and actually does not allow for the kind of innovation and public health outcomes, you know, improvements in public health outcomes that we are seeking sometimes. Um, what else? So, uh, Richard talked a little bit about PHA. I don't want to dwell on this, but just to say that we do have a role across <laughs> that evidence cycle that, uh, that Richard uh, mentioned. That can be problematic at times, and it certainly it leads to interesting discussions, conversations with the Department of Health, because sometimes we are the best place people to do research. Sometimes there are areas where there's particular expertise or capacity in Public Health England, and if Public Health England is not involved, let's say containment, high containment microbiology, so the viruses of the kind of Ebola, then the, the research can take place. But at the same time, we are trying to influence research funding and, and, and influence uh, policy by formulating uh, evidence-based advice. So I wanted to sort of conclude with some thoughts of things that I've learned that perhaps I haven't mentioned already. So one, one thing that interests me also a lot is how we frame questions. And I think we've got, again, a bit of a challenge here that um, our traditional model of research leads us to formulate very narrow, specific questions. And it also leads us to fund the person who's done the last 10 studies in that area. And that really gets in the way of collaboration and, and innovation. Uh, I was recently at Harvard and MIT, and I was very, the, the one thing that I took uh, from my, my time there was the fact that they were asking much broad, expansive questions that allowed really true collaboration between disciplines. I know here at the university you try to collaborate between schools, but actually, how much is true real collaboration bringing in different disciplines? Diversity is key, and I just mean diversity of social demographic factors, but private-private private, private partnership in public health traditionally, you know, we, we think of finance and politics as dirty words, but they are not. That's the reality. We need to work with the people who have got the funds. We need to work with the policymakers if we really want to make a, a, a difference. And um, um, I suppose that the other thing I wanted to say, not, not to go through the whole list, is that I learned something when I was involved in the, in the Ebola response. And I did go to uh, this, that photo, is, is COBRA, uh, cabinet, cabinet Office brief, Briefing Rooms, and I went there to give, uh, to give public health advice. And I was incredibly impressed by the fact that all of the political advisors and all of the officials there knew their stuff inside out. Everybody had read the paper. They had considered it. They were informed. Don't underestimate people. They're intelligent. They, they do read the, the evidence. And, you know, when they are pushing for certain things, it's for, it's for reasons that, you know, that you can, be, can be perfectly valid. So I'll just leave you with, uh, with just some, uh, a quote really thinking that, you know, our public health advice uh, needs to be relevant, and by that it needs to be uh, appropriate to the context, appropriate to the culture, and needs to reflect the needs that 
uh, that the, the society have at the moment, including our institutions and our governments in that context. Thank you, Isabel. Lots of themes there which, which expand on and, and relate to what Richard is saying. Again, any, any specific questions or clarification? In which case, we'll move on. But I just thought, just thought briefly, um, particularly in relation to the audience, I thought your point about, about policymakers moving on every two, three years, and, and my experience in, when I was in the Department of Health was the analytical community, the research community, was really critical as the glue. They tend not to move on quite so quickly. They have accumulated knowledge, and actually they acted as the bridges, internal bridges, often when they were trusted, when they were sort of thought to be helpful and, and, and useful, and were willing to give advice as well as stick to the give judgment as well as advice, very focused on the existing evidence. And I'm just thinking, in terms of community here, actually a role as trusted. Trusted bridger actually outside organisations is really critical too, in, in my view. So maybe we can maybe come on to that sort of um, again that conversation later on. So thank you very much, thank Isabel. You. And now we're going to hear from Christina, who's got a very local perspective. So you have have you travelled far today? Mm -hmm. no, I walked. Good, <laughs> excellent. So a, a, a living paragon of public health, <laughs> um, and we're going to hear. A perspective from, from what does it mean to operate in this in this city and, and the decision makers, the paradigms um, that you have to deal with and bridge on a day to day basis. Okay. Yes, hello everyone. So I'm Christina Gray, I'm Director of Public Health here in Bristol. That means that I work in a local authority. And I realised I was making an assumption coming here that everybody would understand public health and the local authority and directors of public health, but I, having spoken to a few people, I realised that may not be the case. So I'm going to I'm going to go on the boundary, Richard, and uh, <laughs> explain. So um, since uh, the 2012 Health and Social Care Act, local authorities have been required to have a statutory director of public health. So every director, every uh, local authority in the country has a director of public health and a team of specialists. And our job is to support the authority and the area to improve health and reduce health inequality. And there are some sort of mandate, mandations that come with that, I must say that, because our um, Public Health England um, colleagues are here. But our primary job is to provide advice and to ensure that um, the authority does what it can do in terms of health building. So I'm going to go uh, right down to a local view. Bristol has about half a million people, very diverse city, very compact city. We are the city of protest. Uh, we have uh, two sort of universities, a number of colleges on our patch. It's a very well educated city, young city, but of course we also have ageing. So my local view is going to take us through a little bit about the public health project. What, what, what does that mean? Three key principles. So um, this is not an app. What I'm presenting is a personal view. It's an assimilation of um, information and uh, ideas that I have taken with me and applied in practice. And I'd like you to receive it more as a provocation. OK, we're talking about that now. Out in, out in our communities. We talk about provocations rather than presentations. So some of it is a little bit um, controversial, deliberately so, and I put it out there to sort of stimulate debate. I'm not taking a position okay, for some of this. So you, uh, those of you who are involved in public health will know this statement, the art and science of preventing the disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts of society. And I'd just like you to focus on the words art, science, organised and society, because the preventing disease, the pro prolonging life and promoting health are the outcomes that we need to achieve. And this quote, which is quite long in the tooth now, I think is one of the best. Um, quite, uh, people often um, put in politics now, so they'll say art, science and politics. I thought since we were in Perda, I better not put that in there, but, but actually politics sits, I think, within both art and science. 
so principle number one, um, Lindsay said, could I say a little bit about what it, what it means to work in a local authority, local government, as opposed to what we heard from Richard um, and Isabel about working in national government and civil service. So local government is different. It's different from national government. And one of the important things to remember is that elected members are the council, not the officers. It is the elected members who run the council and take the decisions. And those of us who are officers provide advice. The other thing that I think is particular quality of local government is it's very close to its people. So all the actions and decisions that are taken in our council are publicly available and the people who take them, the, um, the cabinet members who are the executive who make the decisions or the elected members who are part of that decisions are very close to the electorate. People write to them. People come, you know, we get doorstep, we have streakers through the chamber, we have, you know, people make themselves known. It's not, you're not wearing an invisible cloak of, um, of uh, protection when you take local uh, decisions in a local authority. There's formal scrutiny through scrutiny. If, if you haven't ever been to a scrutiny, look, uh, just go on the, um, this council or any other council's website and you'll see the, the, um, the uh, meetings. And scrutiny meetings are very interesting. So scrutiny members are elected members or, or people with an interest in what's being scrutinised, but who are not the cabinet, who are not, um, who don't, are not making the decisions. And I think it's a fantastic example of democracy in action. So it, can be, it is uncomfortable as an officer. It is uncomfortable as a decision maker. But actually, that is fundamental to our democratic government um, governance, the way that with the way that we run things, and um, to have your. So, so if I'm called to scrutiny, I, I can be my public health programmes can be poured over. I can be asked why I'm spending money in a particular way. I can be um, asked about the evidence. There is nothing that is that is off bounds. And actually, if you go into it seeing it as a you know peer review, it's brilliant actually. And if things are not quite right, you can you can um, respond to that. But sometimes, you know, you take you take it on the chin and you say, well, actually, I didn't think of that perspective. I'll go away and I'll make my policy or my programmes a bit better. <laughs> And under, underpinning all of that is resource allocation, okay? And particularly in times of austerity, the decisions that elected members are having to make are stark. You know, parks and green spaces versus libraries. Uh, children versus adults, vulnerable people. These are, these are very difficult decisions. And the elected members who make them are just you know, ordinary members of the public who have stepped forward into this role, supported by those of us who are officers. So I kind of, when I was doing this, I thought, okay, that, that um, government, governance, local governance, that's kind of, that's the organized efforts, isn't it? That's organized efforts of society, the way that we govern ourselves. So the second principle that's really important to me in practice is, I, is I've called it the narrative principle. And actually both um, Isabel and Richard uh, refer to this in different ways. That's society. So our getting on for half a million people in Bristol have got a range of beliefs, behaviours, customs, norms, um, perspectives, context, different powers. Um, and there are within that multiple legitimate realities, okay? So until we put on an ethical frame and say that is not a legitimate position, or that's not an ethical position, and we, we, don't, um, we don't hold that value position, or we, we won't um, accept that view, actually competing positions and views are equally valid. And in a local authority context, we have to listen to that. I, as Director of Public Health, have to listen to that, okay? And, um, and I'm listening to multiple voices, conflicted voices, and responding to that. Complexity theory and systems is, is what we're talking about in public health now, and um, I think that is absolutely, absolutely where we have to sit with this. 
And I don't know, it, perhaps it's taken us a long time to recognise that life is complex and that our systems are multiple and complex, but now that we do recognise that, that's a great thing. So that we now have, for instance, the public health advice around um, healthy weight um, is, a, is a complex system map, saying you have to work at different, different levels with different actors at different ways and different times in order to get an effect, not do one thing in a linear way um, to uh, get results. So that's kind of, I think that's society for multiple and competing narratives. And when we're talking about uh, evidence then, I think we're talking about um, the social scientific principle. I'll type away here. We're talking about the development of human knowledge. What do we know? And indeed, as Isabel said, when we have so many big brains in one room and in this university, how is it we're not further ahead of the curve in terms of our big issues? What, what dots are we not joining? And I would say that still, from my perspective, I would see the evidence community, the evidence that comes down and the way that research is um, constructed as coming whatever bit of the spectrum, the realist spectrum or the narrative of the spectrum in terms of it, uh, inquiry, it, it's a systematic activity. So if, if you are undertaking research, I was trying to think if there was any way of doing research that was not systematic, and I, I couldn't think of one. So I think if you're involved in research, the production of evidence, the production of knowledge, it's happening in a systematic way. And the difficulty then comes is, for me, you're applying it into a democratic process and a narrative society with multiple competing voices and views. So we've got that kind of disjoint. <laughs> I wanted to share with you um, a little sort of case study, and I've called it Spot the Evidence, okay? <laughs> Public Health in Action. So I arrived back in Bristol as Director of Public Health quite recently in February, and the city has produced a city plan. So do go in and have a look at it, it's interesting stuff. So this is not the city council, it is the city actors. So everyone who's involved, voluntary community sector, um, private sector, um, and the public sector organisations. And within that city plan, there are three priorities for this year which are aimed by the Health and Wellbeing Group, one of, the, one of which was joint action on period poverty, actually is the action. So I had people coming up to me saying, oh, Christina, you have to do something about that, that city plan. No evidence whatsoever. Period poverty? Where's that in your joint strategic needs assessment? The joint strategic needs assessment is what we have to produce, which informs the evidence, which informs our action. No evidence for this. Just a load of people's views. I think you ought to do something like that. Public health action, health and wellbeing action, should be evidence-based. No evidence for this. So, hmm. do I think there's evidence for this? Well, from my experience of social theory, I know there's a lot of evidence about the importance of social capital and citizen engagement for health. All your social capital theory. So that's access to power. Am I heard? Am I seen? Do I matter? Quite a lot of that in, in, in the work that Richard Wilkinson does around inequality, that actually it's being not seen, not heard, and not mattering, that actually impacts on our sort of um, our very biophysical growth and cells, so that we have stress responses and we come we become ill. So we're understanding a bit about trauma-informed practice. I think there's quite a lot of evidence that I know about, which is about uh, how groups work and how you get nominal groups and how we all get in our silos. And that the evidence that I know about 
is that the way you cut through that is you have a, a shared project. Yeah, if you want to bring people together, you get them working together. I also know that we've got, as I said, a young population in Bristol, younger than average, and that 20% of Bristol's children come from low-income families. We're a diverse city, so issues of gender and power are at play. And then on top of that, we've got empirical evidence, actually, because where did this come from, period poverty? It came because teachers in our schools were saying that there was an issue and they were buying sanitary products for young women who were having difficulties at school. That it was preventing, this issue was preventing young women attending school and it was preventing them participating when they were in school. So then, actually, WHO. What's WHO central to its um, development work uh, globally? The central role of women in society has ensured the stability, progress, and long-term development of nations. What is not to like about period poverty, which very quickly became period dignity, which is mobilising a whole social movement, engaging men and boys as well as women through this uh, window into other conversations. So it's still in there and I think I'm really proud actually that Bristol is doing this. Then just thinking a little bit about evidence and when I was uh, through what I was going to say today and think about what, what evidence, what evidence really lands and works. So there's lots of different sorts of evidence. This is the short list. Um, I think I would say that from my perspective in a local authority, actually it's evidence of impact. So from what I just told you about the, the story of the period dif dignity, what will be important is what impacts we can show from that um, social movement. Um, Economic evidence is really important. It's always been important, but it's really important at the moment. Um, and the difficulty with economic evidence is quite often we can see we save one part of the system, something over here, but actually it's the other part of the system that's got to do the doing to get it. So we need to get that a bit better. But economic evidence is really important. And, and in a local authority like Bristol, so how it lands in a local authority like Bristol would listen to the wider economic arguments of young women experiencing period poverty in school and being excluded from attending, you know, pursuing their education, getting into employment. So that's an economic argument that my authority would absolutely understand if we can quantify and articulate it. And I think probably, and this may be where uh, actually some of our boundary issues and bumps come, is that possibly retrospective evidence is more useful than prospective evidence. So we've got lots of prospective evidence of something that happens over here. There's some blue light project that's won an award and PHE keeps setting it around. And I keep thinking, well, yeah, that's great. That happened in Yorkshire and they got an award, but I'm not quite sure how I would you know, how I would get that in. Whereas actually, if you can prove what you've done works and build on it, that's possibly a kind of better way in to all of this from a local perspective. So this may be a bit of a surprise to some of you. I, I don't know um, in terms of I'm the, I'm the local one, I'm the one that's probably furthest from academia and research although endlessly fascinated by it, and some of my best friends are academic <laughs> researchers. Um, but actually, what helps me keep my compass in all of this is, um, is theory. Okay, so I, I would put myself in the sort of critical constructivist paradigm or meta-theory place, because that view of the world allows me to count things, quantify things, look at cause and effect, um, the sort of 
biomedical um, evidence, but it also allows me to step across and look at narrative and um, value and conflicting perspectives. So that's where I am. And it's really important for me that I know that's where I am. It's my compass. I don't need everybody else to be in that space. I need to be in that space or I can't function. And epistemology. So how do we know? What's the knowing that we're talking about? You know, what sort of evidence are we talking about? What's valid and how does it land? And paradigms being mentioned already. How, how are we seeing and interpreting the world? And in summary, um, I think because there are multiple realities at play, multiple legitimate realities at play, all of the time, in different, at different levels, I think probably I'd say we all need to be paradigm literate. So it's like it's a link, you know, if you, if you were um, traveling and, and, and traveling through different countries, you would have to be linguistically um, adept, able to speak different languages and understand different cultures. And I think that's, I think it's a different way of saying what Rich has already said about the crossing the boundaries. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, any, any quick clarifying questions before we move on to our final speaker? No. Okay, so we will pick many of those strands up. I thought particularly, um, Olivia, your point around system, the systematic evidence paradigm meeting the complex democratic system in local in local government, local situation more broadly, is to, it, talking of boundaries, that's a fantastic sort of how, how that plays out and the role of directors of public health in particular in that, really critical. So uh, last speaker, last but by no means least, least uh, Dr. Olivia Maynard from the university. Yeah. So hopefully not too far to come. No, absolutely. Uh, but I'm really pleased uh, Olivia's going to talk about actually her work actually in this field from, a, from your perspective of an academic and I was really, Great to see that you're currently also an academic fellow in the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. So if you haven't heard of it, post, look for post notes on Google. They're masterpieces of concise evidence. They're two or three sides long and they summarise beautifully the complex territory. I'm working on it, it's very hard. I'm sure, I'm sure yours does too. <laughs> so over to Olivia. Hi everyone. Um, so yes, I'm the, um, maybe perhaps an academic perspective on um, work with policymakers, um, and I think actually as an academic it's kind of odd that my talk is a lot more practical, it's kind of practical tips rather than the sort of theoretical underpinning which the previous three speakers have spoken about beautifully, so thank you um, for relieving me of that. Um, so I'm going to talk very, very briefly just about my research just to give you a bit of context um, and then think about why we might advise public health decision makers and um, how we can get involved um, and then my reflections on doing so. I'm sorry, I can't see you guys over there. Um, yeah, so my so I'm a lecturer in psychological science here, um, and my research I'm one of the co-directors of the tobacco and alcohol research group, and my research is on behaviour change. Um, most of my work, well, well in terms of was on tobacco and nicotine. Um, my PhD was on standardised packaging, and I'll talk a bit, a bit about that um, in this talk. Um, I do research on e-cigarettes, and that's already been mentioned a couple of times today. Um, I'm kind of interested in how we can um, correct misperceptions around e-cigarettes. Um, the very short version is, if you're a smoker, they're a lot less harmful, and PHE have provided excellent guidance that they're at least for 95% less harmful than cigarettes. Anyway, um, I have to always say that. Um, alcohol, I do research on alcohol, um, looking at choice architecture interventions, so ways we can change the environment in which we in which we drink to encourage healthier drinking or less harmful drinking, we should say. Um, research on alcohol labelling, um, so unit calorie and um, health line labelling. Um, and I also do research on other drugs as well, um, um, particularly focused on harm reduction and student drug use. Um, so, so why to advise public health decisions? Um, I'll talk about each of these in a bit more detail in a moment, but. Um, uh, the first thing is that I think it's important that we do that. I mean, most people here are either working as researchers or academics or working in practice, um, and there must be a reason that we're doing that, right? We must think there's some sort of, um, there's something that we need to know, there's something that needs to be changed or uh, something needs to be looked at in more detail. Um, and so if we just trap our researching 
academic papers, um, it's never really going to have the impact that we want it to have. So it's important that we do that. The other obvious reason is that our research is often funded by government or the public, and it's important to translate that research back to them. Um, I think it's interesting to doing that. You know, we do spend a lot of time in our labs um, talking to other academics, and it's really uh, valuable, interesting, important to um, spend time speaking to people with a different perspective as well. And finally, the dreaded word, um, if you're an academic, impact. Um, we all know how important impact is these days. And, um, you know, one way to have impact um, is, you know, by working with policymakers um, and, and talking to people about our research. Um, so, so how might we get involved? Uh, yeah, three ways now, you know, I will talk about these in more detail. Proactively present your research to people, um, go and find people who might be interested, uh, respond to calls for evidence, and work directly with policymakers. Um, so for this first one about introducing, yeah, proactively presenting your research, um, go and introduce yourself uh, to people. Um, but today's a good opportunity to do that. Um, but you know, perhaps you might start with MPs or peers that might be interested in your area. Um, speak to your local MP. Um, that could be where you live or perhaps where your university is. Um, look at the all-party parliamentary groups. I know most people here will know what the APPGs are, um, but just in case you don't, I think it's fascinating. Uh, there's a link online, you can see what all the all-party parliamentary groups are. They're sort of informal groups um, led by backbench MPs um, on specific areas. And I just looked at some of the A's today. Uh, air pollution, alcohol harm, autism, ancient woodlands and veteran trees. That's great. Um, so you know, if you're, you know, look at Go and have a look at this whole long list and um, see um, who's running these different groups um, and perhaps maybe think about contacting those people as they're going to have a vested interest in your, in your area. Um, look at the Hansard directory, which is a verbatim report of everything that's discussed in Parliament. See who's discussing your um, area of interest. Um, and also look at the early day motions. So these are um, Motions for debate, as far as I understand it, motions for debate, um, most of which never get actually debated, but are a way of raising awareness of a specific issue. Um, and people can also sign up their support for this to be debated. So again, another way to see who's interested in your area. So, so look at all these places if you want to you know, find out who might listen to you. Um, introduce yourself to the subject specialist in the House of Commons Library Research Service, and you can find details of that online. So that when they come up, you know, they've got a question and they need to find some experts, um, you know, they're going to they're contact you because they know about you. Um, contact those working in government, so people working in PHE or people working in the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, introduce yourself to relevant advocacy groups. So Action on Smoke and Health has already been mentioned, and um, I work quite closely with them. Um, alcohol concern for me, but you know, think about who those groups might be for you. Um, I'll talk about in a moment how they might help you. Um, introduce yourself to people working in Policy Bristol. They've obviously um, organised today, it's uh, fantastic. Um, and not only do they send out a newsletter, but they'll also, if they know who you are, will be able to send you, if this is if you work at Bristol Uni, they'll be able to send you a, um, if an opportunity arises, they'll think, oh, let's ask this person because we know what they do. Um, and then also get involved in parliamentary events. There's the Royal Society pairing scene, which I've not done, but one of my um, colleagues has done, where they pair you with an MP or someone working in parliament or someone working in government. Um, and I think typically you spend a week working with them um, in Westminster, perhaps. And then they'll also come to visit you here. And so it's a really nice way to find out about how government works, how parliament works. Um, have a look, you know, once you've identified which APPGs you're interested in, um, just look and see if they're running any events um, and get involved in those. They might even ask you to give a talk, perhaps. Um, this is me at the APPG on Smoking and Health uh, with the then um, MP for Bristol West, Stephen Williams, who's also the chair of the APPG on Smoking and Health um, with Angela Atwood. Um, yes, it was a while ago. Uh, yeah. And that's, so that's yeah, nice, another nice opportunity to, to, get, to get involved and, and to find out how these things work. The other thing you might do is respond to calls for evidence. So I mentioned that Policy Bristol might send you these kinds of opportunities, or any of those people that you've already made contact with might say, oh, look, we've got something on e-cigarettes. Um, can you comment on this, or can you get involved in helping us prepare a response for this? Um, so I was involved in a consultation response 
on introduction of um, standardised packaging. So this was in, so this consultation I think around 2011, um, and as you know, we finally got uh, plain packaging introduced in 2017. Um, and so, so we got involved directly um, in, the, in, a, in a consultation response. We also worked with Action on Smoking and Health on their response. And our um, research was used by a num number of other organisations in their response as well. And that's really through, I'll talk about this in a moment, you know, being in the right place at the right time, but also you know, letting people know that you exist is key. Um, and also you can work directly with policy makers. And I mentioned the Royal Society Pairing Scheme, which is a nice way to you know, work with people. Um, but there's also some other opportunities. If you're a PhD student, uh, if you supervise PhD students, you might consider some of the internships that are available. Uh, so I think UKRI, um, so if you're UKRI funded, there's three month internships that you can apply for. And when I was doing my PhD, I worked in the cabinet office in the behavioural insights team, which is not actually there anymore. But um, they're a team um, who, um, sort of a team of ec economists and psychologists who um, do research um, about the evidence. Broadly. Um, and that was a really interesting opportunity. It was a good way to find out how policy works, how different it is from academia, different timescales and so on. I'll talk about that as well. Um, but it would really, really, if you have time in your PhD and obviously extend your PhD by three months, I think, did for me, um, it was a really great way, um, it was a really important, really useful thing to do. And I would really highly recommend it. Um, so yes, I'm also doing a fellowship at the moment with the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. Um, it's, um, so you can do it if you're an academic. They have academic <coughs> fellowships, but they also have um, fellowships for PhD students as well. And again, you have three months out and work on this specific post note. And again, I really highly recommend doing that. Um, and you don't just have to work with policymakers in the UK. You can think about opportunities elsewhere. So I'm working with some colleagues in Colombia, and we're working with the Ministry of Health there on some stuff related to tobacco packaging again, and some stuff on e-cigarettes. Um, so think about you know where else you might be able to um, to use your evidence and work with people. Um, and so just a few reflections. Kind of I've kind of mentioned these already, but. Um, there's a point about time scales that I think that someone mentioned. Um, that you know, people in, in academia were kind of working on a, pro a problem that really we don't really care about anymore. Or I don't know, you know, we, 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 our, our time scales are much slower than we than we might find in policy. And when I was working in um, the cabinet office, I just felt like everything had to be done by yesterday. Um, it was much faster pace than I was used to. Um, but equally, I think that. If you take the example of standardised packaging, the policy making process can be really slow as well. So we started talking about standardised packaging in 2009, and then there was a consultation in 2011, and then legislation was passed in 2014, and then it was fully implemented in 2017. And there's plenty of opportunities across that whole period to get involved in a number of different ways. And so, um, yeah, the, the timelines are just quite different from what we're used to. And I think it's as an academic, um, you kind of have to be prepared for that. For that. I think the main thing is about how much quicker the timeframes are. And if you, know, you, you might see a consultation, um, but it might need a response in a, in a month or so. And so you, need to, you do need to act quickly if you do want to be involved in things. Um, so a few people have spoken about the importance of evidence. And I think I, I was very naive. I do remember yeah, being very naive when I worked in the cabinet office and thought, well, you know, the evidence suggests X. And so why aren't we doing X? Um, and Obviously, that's not how things work. Um, and I think that, was it Christine that mentioned the multiple legitimate realities? And I think that's a really interesting point. Um, you know, even just because your evidence suggests that, for example, standardized packaging may be effective for some people, that doesn't mean that we should definitely introduce it because there's lots of other competing realities. And that's what policymakers have to weigh up. Um, and I think, so, so as academics, I think we need to be aware of that at the very least. Um, but still think, you know, we do need to present our research, our, our reality, what's our reality, and let the policymakers think about the competing realities. Um, and the other, other thing related to this is the, um, well, yeah, the com other competing interests. Um, so, oops, 
So I, I mentioned that I'm working this post at the moment, and my <coughs> post note is on the influence of industry on public health policy. Um, so, and this kind of fits quite nicely with this because um, so I'm, I'm writing about how the tobacco industry and the food industry and the alcohol industries might influence public health policy. Um, and and it, yeah, it's, it, com it complicates things. Um, so as an academic, we might say that um, the research shows that uh, we need more warnings on alcohol labelling, but the alcohol industry are obviously going to have something to say about that. And there's, um, there's different ways in which uh, policymakers can engage with um, these different industries. So just briefly, for the tobacco industry, there's um, the WHO uh, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which prevents policymakers from actively engaging with um, the policymakers from engaging with the tobacco industry. Um, but that doesn't that isn't the case for the alcohol industries and the food industries. And the general um, MO is for active engagement, which means that we often have voluntary agreements with the alcohol and food industry. So voluntary agreements on labelling. Um, or voluntary reformulation. And that kind of perhaps might change the ways in which um, policymakers or evidence is used. Um, and then just, just to finish, um, I wanted to uh, just say a little thing about imposter syndrome. Um, so you are more of an expert than you think, and the irony is not lost on me that PowerPoint think that experts have to have moustaches. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to change that. Yeah, you are more an expert than you think you are. Um, and uh, if you don't, if you don't contribute your evidence and if you don't contribute your expertise, and um, someone else is going to do that for you. Um, so you know, do you always consider get, getting involved. And even though you, you know, they might be interested in, in my case, for example, tobacco control policy generally, and you think, oh, I only know my PhD is only about this small part of it. Chances are you know a lot more than you think you do, and chances are you know a lot more than perhaps that other person does as well. So I really would recommend you getting involved. Um, and you know, I kind of had imposter syndrome when I was asked to give this talk. I thought, well, what do I know? And perhaps there's lots of people here who've done more <laughs> than I have. Um, and really, what much of what I've done has been serendipitous. I was in the right place at the right time. But related to that, and I think related to what I've spoken about already, is that um, <coughs> you know, if you do introduce yourself to people, if you do get to know people, people will, will ask you. And even though you think, well, there's probably other people that know more than I do. Um, they're not going to get asked because no one knows who they are. Um, so you, you know, do make sure you get yourself out there. Do get involved. Um, remember that you are an expert, and um, I think you know, enjoy it because it's an important and interesting part of our jobs. Any points of clarification? In which case we'll move on. Please do take a seat. So I'll, I'll stand up here. Uh, we've got Fido. Hopefully you, you've remembered that. Let's see, shall we? So thank you all, and thank you all for sticking to time. Perfectly. So you're very well trained. It wasn't. I think it was Lindsay that was training you. Um, so we've got lots of time for Q and A and conversation with yourselves. So let's. There are lots. Before we go to slide, I think there are lots of themes that hopefully will come up for me. Just, just taking chairs progress. I'm not answer, asking questions, but just drawing some sort of some of this together. Um, feels like a lot of conversation about paradigms and being aware of the paradigm that, that you have, but also the people you are seeking to influence, or the systems, or the part of the system that you're seeking to influence, and what what's their <coughs> paradigm of knowledge and impact and uh, and activity. Um, then we talked a little bit, but not, not that much, about types of evidence and what counts as evidence. And for me, um, and maybe we can come on to this in, uh, in questions around the clarity of presentation of evidence, particularly as we hear to policymakers or those that are close to policymaking who often are moving at incredible pace. So actually, when you've got the opportunity to be able to say something quite clearly, is really is really critical whilst doing justice to the uncertainty around it so for me and we may come on to this that sense of being um someone who is who can have a, a an insightful conversation with give some advice and say actually the evidence is uncertain it's not clear but this is my view given given all the knowledge that i have and often the knowledge is 
as we're hearing, that you often have, but you don't think you have. You've got far more knowledge than many, many other people. But also doing justice to actually the people in, in, the, in these sorts of roles have huge knowledge themselves and lots and lots of experience. So actually doing justice uh, and realising that the reason they're not acting is not often not that they don't know they're not, they don't have the knowledge. It's they, they need help to actually have to apply it to the particular question that they're focusing on. And then I guess before we come on to Slido, I guess that point right at the beginning that I think you made, Richard, about, about there, is, there is a sense here about willingness to get your hands dirty. So there's a question for all of us about how willing are we to engage in that and what does that mean for, for all of us. So lots, lots of stuff there and lots of uh, specifics from our speakers. Going to Slido, thank you very much for using them and you've used the voting question too. So we've got a question, I'll go to the top. Um, question from Sophie. So again, just, just pick this up, um, any of you. Should all research which influences policy be required to be co-produced with user groups and policy makers to fix the relevance and implementation issue? Anyone want to reflect on that? Or is that too, too much of an art, depending on what particular policy it may be? Anyone want to pick that question up? I think I would turn the question around a little bit and so say... Very policy maker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll turn the question around. Well, well, saying, what do you think you need to be able to answer the real question that's relevant, that needs to be answered? What other input, what other perspectives do you need to, to make sure that you, that you reach the best, uh, you know, that you provide the best possible evidence? The chances are that, um, you know, that you will be able to do a better piece of work by involving other people and doing it in partnership. But I wouldn't say that that it needs to be a requirement. It just should be more or less common sense, mm -hmm. I think. What was this thing? Yeah, I was just I, similar to um, Isabel. I think it's horses for courses. It depends what the area is. Um, and you need to get the right people around the table, depending on the issue. I mean, thinking about the um, the cigarette packaging, uh, you know, that actually you would have to test that. You need to do your insight work, so you would need to get some kind of user views in order to sort of land that. Um, and you need to involve industry and um, and and commerce and others. Um, but I mean, there may be areas where they're quite niche where you wouldn't. So, because the, the other thing that can happen, actually, from a, a local perspective, is you can get research fatigue. We get a lot of requests, local authority get a lot of requests to participate, and communities get a lot of requests to participate in research. And I think that's fine if there's payback, but I think sometimes if it, if it feels that um, communities and stakeholders are being mined for research, then there's a bit of a resistance to that. So it's got to be mutual if you're going to do it. I just say briefly, I, I think perhaps we could all do a slowing down our research slightly and um, spending a bit more time speaking to the people that our research um, is about or for or with. Um, and you know, doing that really important. I really think that PPI is really important, not at the end, but at the beginning, to make sure we've worked out what research questions are important for them. Um, and if that means taking a little bit longer, then that means taking a little bit longer. So, so one of the things that about this insider perspective, who are you an insider? Uh, you know, I, I've been a civil servant uh, as, as well as being a sort of more practice orientated manager in the, health, in the NHS. But, but you learn how to ask policy questions, how to develop what is the policy question that you are interested with. And, and researchers spend a lot of time developing the research method skills, what is the research question that we're asking? Rarely do we put the policy question, the research question, directly next to each other and see if they are about the same thing. And uh, that quotation that I used about, uh, that came from the senior civil servant, that the researchers seem to be answering yesterday's policy question tomorrow, reflects that mismatch. Uh, and to me it seems that um, involving the field the people at the, at the front line in the framing of the question is really important to address that mismatch that often happens. You know, and I can think of quite a few specific examples where um, policymakers have generated a question about which there is never going to be any research because of the way that research funding operates is that no one's ever going to try and answer that question. I, I have a little favourite example which is should you switch all fridges off? 
um, was a question that we, we got asked at one stage around it. And it seems a silly question. And I, I can't imagine everyone has thought that in an emergency, should we switch off fridges is a topic that's ever been put forward for a PhD. <laughs> but it was a genuine it's a question at a particular point in time. Yeah. It'd be interesting to track this, actually, in Bristol. Are there going to be any more PhDs but, responding to your view? Your... But, but that, that was a question because there was a fire at Grenfell Tower that was started yeah. from a fridge. So you then say, what is the logical question that you ask from that? Oh, should we switch off fridges? How do you address that sort of a question? And there's a related sort of question here that was, um, uh, about research is overstretched, underfunded, made slow progress, and is there funding available from EGPHE to help answer the important public health question? Which also relates to questions about around the gaps, about actually what, what are the gaps? Um, and I guess it's just to say that NIHR, as far as I understand it, are actually working particularly with local government to try and help the research questions be framed in a way that is going to be most relevant to local government. Are you aware of that? Yeah, yeah. that's a big Would funding you? stream um, that's just coming out, we're coming to see it and involved in that. But just to say that locally we've got Bristol Health Partners, which is, um, that's the, the local health organisations and local authorities who put money into a local health partnership, which is about research and practice, and a number of colleagues from that partnership are here. So, um, so yeah, people are putting money in. Um, the Bristol Health Partners are here? Yeah. You put your hands up. Yeah. There we go. Would you like to say a little bit about Bristol Health Partners for those that don't know? Yes, so we're um, a collaboration between the two Bristol universities, the three big health delivery partners, so the hospital trusts and the mental health trust, and the commissioners, so the local authority and the uh, clinical pension group. Um, and, um, so, and even within the commissioning group, um, there are researchers and associated health and research networks. So I think that works here. Yeah, and Joe, great. Yes. Quick hands up. Okay, make yourself know. So may, maybe head towards those guys um, <laughs> in the networking session if you're interested. Right. So, 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 so money. <laughs> 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 Just in case you think. There's a really important opportunity for um, academics and health practitioners and commissioners to talk together about the sort of things you're talking about today um, and to, um, to frame those questions. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Isabel, did you Just to answer specifically the question, so PHE does not commission research, we are not a research funding uh, uh, body, but we do work with, with research funders and I've been doing a lot of work to, uh, with all of them to, to try and, and have discussions about how do we make sure that we are, they, you know, that the needs that we have from a public, public health perspective are met. And they're very, very keen and very uh, desperate, really, to have this dialogue about what, you know, what, uh, you know, what kind of research do we get funded. There are, of course, lots of opportunities to, uh, to collaborate with PHE in research, and you know, we can discuss those. But just to clarify that we, we are not a, a research funding uh, body. But you are open to, I mean, the critical thing about you're open to be talked to, aren't you? So in terms of, in terms of influencing somebody really important in the system, both nationally and locally, because have regional offices too. Where's the regional office in this? And there's lots is it, of, is it in Bristol? In Bristol, yeah. yes, yeah. very close to the, the station, uh, Temple Meads. But we do have lots of opportunities. So Lucy here is uh, working in PAT with a research funded post jointly with the University of, of Bristol. So, so those things exist. And just to live here, so it's not so much the funding, but you've been proactive uh, clearly in your career by actually reaching out. Uh, how, how did you go about that as an individual? And what, what led you to do that? Just talking to people. Um, <laughs> but I know, but I know, just personally, I know when I was a researcher, it was, it was quite hard for me to, to, to do that. There's a question here about the skills or maybe the practice. Um, yeah. No, I think, I, no, I, I, think I think my last point about serendipity, I think I was very fortunate during my PhD to be working on a topic that was so hotly contested and it was, you know, there was lots of work going on on standardised packaging at the time and so they were looking for people who might know a little bit about it. Um, did that actually affect your decision, or was that? How do you mean? Did that affect your decision about your PhD mm -hmm. itself? It just it was a, it was a little bit of luck. Yeah, it was all luck. <laughs> but um, recognizing your luck and make the most of yes, it. I think that's, yes, I think capitalizing on luck yeah. is is important. Um, yeah, and just you know going to conferences, meeting people, you know, 
finding who those people are and going and saying hi. It's, it's not really rocket science. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's really helpful because yeah. it, cause it, but it, it can be quite, I know personally, it can be quite hard to, yeah. to do. Yeah. The first time's the hardest, yeah. the second time. I, mean, I think so. about, I was talking about this with some colleagues today about, you know, what your elevator pitch is for your, you know, your research and think about what that is and how might that differ for different types of people. You know, perhaps you might have a written one that you might email, you might say, oh, nice to meet you today. Here's like a paragraph about what I do, just to, you know, always be thinking about how you can tell people about your research in new, exciting or new ways. Thank you. Would you mind just refreshing the questions or recents? And that, yeah. let's go to the real world. So we've got two questions here. I'll take, there's three, or maybe take three together. Sorry, I could do that. Sorry. Okay. And if you might just mind saying who you are. So there first on the right. Thank you. Yep, sorry. So just take the second question, okay. sorry, and then, yeah. and then we'll have to hold on that for a second. Yeah. Charlie, what's the Centre for Exercise and Nutrition in Health Sciences? Uh, lots of the work for policymakers have worked for for a long time. Um, do you think uh, academics just have the opportunity to promote their research into policymakers should have the same responsibility to criticise policy? <laughs> I like that two way straight here. Any final third question? In which case, sorry to interrupt. Off. Far, far, far away, Christina. Yeah, so what's the pay so the payback um, that I would be looking for and that I would encourage my authority to be looking for is that it makes a difference. So that's not to say that the, uh, the, the, um, that seeking knowledge doesn't have a value in itself, okay? But if you're going to engage um, with us and our resources and the resources of our people, then, um, then that, it, it has to contribute in the real world. It has to make things better. It has to improve things in some way. So it needs to be bringing a real life, um, do, do something that we couldn't do, already do. And an example would be, it's a collaboration, um, uh, to actually it's the two universities again approached us um, and it's uh, looking at uh, placemaking, so it's planning policy for the true something. Okay. Mm -hmm. True D. True D. Yeah, funny name. True D. Yeah. <laughs> Another tip call it something. <laughs> Make it something, because I can never quite remember. Um, but that's a collaboration between the university here, it's crossing different um, departments, I think. And uh, we were approached, along with Manchester's, another, another big um, centre. So um, the planning people are involved, and I was looking at this thing. Well, yeah, this is really interesting. But absolutely, the director of um, placemaking and myself said this is fine if it adds value to what we were looking at place in Bristol. We've got real big issues around place, around um, a place which excludes. How do we build inclusive communities? How do we plan for health? Those are big questions. If getting involved in all that research stuff doesn't help it nudge us forward in some way on that, actually they can go away and pick another town, city, yeah? So, and I think they're going to. So, so the research, just in case any of you are here, they were very um, responsive to that and um, it's going to be, um, but there, there were issues with that because of course it's been, the, that, re, that research um, proposal's already been signed off, so it's been through all, all the sort of ethics committees and everything, so there's something written down. So actually by the time we are asked to participate, it's kind of a little bit late in the day, so that goes back to the building it in early. Anyone else want to say, what, what does payback, particularly from Richard, um, Isabel's perspective, what, what, what makes what makes sense as payback for you from research? So, so one of the interesting things about the way in which research gets used and the, and the way that people have thought about that is actually often it, it, it influences policy and decision making through what's been called an enlightenment approach. So if you're trying to think that there is this conclusion here that will lead to this action there in a nice simple linear way, then you, that will happen very rarely and you'll be incredibly lucky 
<laughs> what you're doing is trying to build a, a body of uh, knowledge, so I'll use the word knowledge word rather than evidence in here, that's got several different facets and dimensions to it. And out of that, opportunities occur. And this is why Isabel was referring to, the, to John Kingdon's work, because this, this idea around the policy window uh, as an opportunity when there's a problem going along, there's some policy solutions that are being discussed, and then the politics enables the window, in that sense, to be opened and for you to do something is really important. So this sounds rather theoretical and abstract, but actually what we're interested in is things that contribute to that body of knowledge, because building up the knowledge, body of knowledge becomes really important when the window opens. You know, Jamie Oliver's engagement around the childhood obesity agenda created a political window that was open that had been very difficult to move before. But if you haven't got a body of academic knowledge and application of that academic knowledge that can then be drawn on really quite quickly in that situation, like you were describing, that everything seems to go at a pace suddenly, then um, it's, the window's going to close before you can do anything about it. So, has anyone, has anyone heard of the win policy windows theory? How many people, roughly? So quite a few of you, which I think is great. So for lay person, if those that haven't, it's Roger, is it Roger Kingdon? John Kingdon. John Kingdon, so it's not us. It's Kingdon, and um, it's John Kingdon. And, and it's, uh, for me, again, from my experience, it was a that's the, 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 the one theory that sort of, and every theory is, you know, has its pros and cons, but that's the one that make, made most sense to me. Uh, and, and, and I guess the challenge to, and it's a really hard challenge to people who are not, uh, not that close to the policy world is actually recognising when a window is open, when there's an opportunity to sort of you say to go through it. So if you haven't if you haven't heard of it, do look at. I think that's one of the things I would say. Do have a quick look at that and look it up, um, because I think that's the one that most resonates for me about influencing policy. And so if you understand that, and you and you recognise a window that may be coming and why, and then and then have the opportunity to act alongside it. And particularly also, it's interesting. Richard, you mentioned Jamie Oliver. The other person who people talk about at the moment is David Attenborough, isn't it? And, um, and plastics, etc. There's something around the coalitions here too. Who's who's in the spearhead? So Jamie Oliver might have been really important in terms of the politicians want to speak to someone like Jamie Oliver, but he needs the research and the coalitions behind him. Similarly, David Attenborough. So I guess one question. Sorry, I'm going to come come back. But one question is the importance of people and personalities. In, in policy making and, and, and pushing through evidence. Any more reflections on that or is that, or is that basically a sort of um, a bit of a red herring do you think? Anyone? So I think you've described some positive influences but they can also be negative. Yeah. And we do, uh, well it sort of can relate to, to your question uh, from the perspective that you know you, you sometimes have got you know, well-meaning people with a view of the world who can be very successful and in, at influencing policy, but actually, you know, divert resources or funding from, you know, what the real issues are, and that can be that can be difficult. So I was going to challenge you a little bit, thinking about. Um, I'm, I'm not sure it resonates with me a lot, this idea of promoting your own research. Uh, I think the question for me is about how do we create better, more effective partnerships and collaborations. Uh, you are, uh, by and large, not, not always, but a lot of the time, funded by the public purse in the same way as we are. Um, so the question is how do we align our efforts to, to answer the questions that are particularly relevant to today and need to be answered. And, you know, it's, it's not so much about the interests of individual academics in pursuing their own, uh, their own idea yeah. nowadays because the, risk, the, the research funding bodies ask for evidence of impact. You know, you now need to find a way of engaging just to get the money to continue doing what you were always doing. And that's, that doesn't help us, that doesn't help the public. Um, so it's about how do we think about, you know, can we collaborate more effectively to actually do, uh, you know, have, have a greater true impact, real impact on, on, on health. Thank you. I a big point about policy windows. Yes. Um, the problem with what sorry, you're, you're, you're sorry, 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 from the law school, the yeah. 
Um, the, the problem with the, the point that you've just identified there is, is that, you know, Jane on the Jane on the point, is that everyone else is going to be looking at that and seeing it at the same time. So how do we make our research stand out from everyone else doing the same thing at the same time? It seems to me that you are probably better off trying to identify a policy window that's just about <laughs> that no one else has noticed yet. <laughs> yeah. But so I don't know how you do that either. No, and well, very rarely do academics open policy windows. Yeah, sure. I think if we're thinking that's the case, you know, the one that jumps out to me is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is in the bad way which is Andrew Wakefield published a paper in The Lancet that has a massive impact. How often do papers in The Lancet have any impact at all? And I think we know from the subsequent research by communication specialists was that it wasn't, that, it wasn't actually the paper that generated this. It was the debate, the debate that happened afterwards, particularly Tony Blair not willing to say whether his son Leo had been vaccinated or not, which had a massive impact on perceptions about it. So I think that's really Born. Uh, can, I, can we come back to the point? I wonder if we yeah. just go back to the point. Is it Charlie? Charlie, yeah. Yeah. So, because I think that's a really that's a really important question. And to me, it's about purpose. What's the purpose of you making the contribution about and promoting your research? And what's the purpose of critiquing? And uh, sometimes that is about the audience for, the, for, for what you're saying is a public audience rather than a policy making audience and that is important in terms of public debate and discourse. Um, in order to, for policy to be better people have to critique it. You know, the, the, the original conception is not perfect policy, it's really imperfect policy and it has to go through this process. So, so people who are contributing acad from academia into policy have to critique it but the way in which you critique it is as important as the way in which you promote the evidence. That's what we're saying here. And so thinking about the consequences of the method, the mechanism and the means, is as important as the content of the message, I think. So yes to critiquing, but choose what sort of critique. Because sometimes we need a big public story about it and, a, and, a, and it being presented by the media as an argument. And sometimes we need the quiet world by tapping on the shoulder. Both are equally important. I was going to say, how are, how are people in the audience meant to know that, though, in terms of the right time with the right, yeah. with the, with the right sort of presentation or the right, um, the right thing at the right time? What, what, what advice would you give them? I guess it links to some of the um, questions on, uh, on, on Slido about, about advising researchers to develop the skills needed to cross boundaries. Which feels is a bigger question about about so I guess I'm going to ask my own question here. I guess it's about the relationships and, and the, the hard work put in to actually creating the relationships. So you know who to tap. At least you know who to tap on the shoulder. Who might tap somebody else on the shoulder. So it, it feels to me a lot of this is quite hard from outside to actually start and, 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 and guess at. Um, would you agree with that or, or or not? Or is it easier than that? Not not just you, Richard. I, th I think it's very much about the, the, those longer term relationships and partnerships. So if I use the example of the NIHR funded health protection research unit here in Bristol on evaluation of interventions. You know, it's been going on for six years, it's been recommissioned, so we've got a very long term uh, relationship there and a very good understanding of, uh, so, so the work that that unit is undertaking is informed by, by uh, PHS research priorities and designed to meet those needs. And that works really well. Uh, that's just an example. There are others, but it's about, I think, the having those longer term partnerships and relationships. I think it's also possibly got to be systematic. So about thinking about it from a local authority perspective. <laughs> You know, when I talk, when I was talking about the, you know, being open to scrutiny, we are scrutinised, criticised. Um, uh, people said their views all the time. Now, if you want something to really land, as opposed to just be another voice shouting about something that's happening, then I think it needs to be not just one person. But if it was a department, so we've got the two universities here. And um, there is a policy team in the city council. So if there was public policy that you were particularly interested about, if you were to contact them to say, we would be interested to be a critical friend, we'd like to be involved with that, I think that would be welcomed. You would have to, however, it needs to A, not be an individual thing, it needs to be a you know, more um, collective uh, response. 
but you would also have to understand all that other stuff about how local democracy works and local decision making and not be naive about how that policy is being formulated. Um, certainly as Director of Public Health for Bristol, um, we engage with, with both the universities, they are our critical friends, we would come, you know, if we, if we were looking for something, we'd certainly be reaching out in terms of um, seeking advice, um, but not on an individual basis. It has to be on a stronger platform. So, so I think that's where the Health Protection Research Unit is a really interesting example. When they were created in 2013, money was taken out of PHE as it was newly formed and put into universities. So it was a really painful process for us because we suddenly had a budget deficit that we hadn't expected. But actually what it's created is a genuine sense of jointness um, that I think means that the academic becomes very close to the practitioner, the practitioner becomes very close to the academic. Uh, and I think we ought to be together working to try and set up similar sorts of projects in the health improvement space, whatever we mean by that, because, because it has a, a, a real opportunity to help straddle those two words that crosses those boundaries that bring the strengths of the two perspectives. I've written down a question about what's it, what's it, what does being research active mean? Because that was a phrase that you used at the beginning and I was thinking about you, but what does being active with policy makers and practitioners mean? And I think those are really important questions about our identity of ourselves. And for me also, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, the status that goes with it. Yeah. So there's something about what are the rewards to you in academia? Is it publishing that paper in The Lancet, which you say no one reads? I'm sure someone does, <laughs> but um, or m many people don't. So, so there's something about, about how the reward system in academia and how that relates to policy and practice. I know NIH are interested in. So great, got some hands up, which is fantastic. So some questions from the audience. So lady at the back and then lady at the front, and then maybe one other, if we've got another one. So we've got another one. Cool. Uh, Catherine Hamzer of Public Health Registrar, working in both authority at the moment. Um, so I'm as a minority engineer being in practice rather than in the research world. And my question is about how do we reach out to those who are in the research world in an effective way? I'm thinking of a recent example when we were in a program uh, for migrant health, we think it would be great to get some really good evaluations, but because actually when we look at the evidence base, there's nothing really out there. And maybe what we're doing is quite a small scale program doing the scheme of things, but when I spoke to a few academics, I was aware, well, maybe we've got national funding and we can't do this. And it felt like there were, it was a sort of black box really of knowing who to speak to and what kind of things they would be interested in and how best to go about it. So I just wondered if there is a platform where those in practice can reach out to academics and say, this is what we've there is, there is, it's a great question. There is just quickly there is one there is a where, there is a Twitter feed called PH Finder, which <laughs> which I know other people might know of, which is trying to do that matchmaking job. So you made quick quick answer would be to have a quick look at that. But I'll let, let the panel pick that question up when we're taking the other two. But yes, please. And one awesome question. Um, so I'm in boundaries behind space between evidence and practice. Um, and we've just won some funding for a health foundation project, which is all about getting evidence into policy improvement projects nationally. Yeah. Um, and so we're very much trying to tackle this problem about how do we get evidence that you guys and everyone nationally, and you know, what is that evidence? What is it? What is knowledge? How do we translate the knowledge that people into practice as quickly as possible? What are the challenges of doing that? I think just listening to some of the comments earlier, there's a piece about um, when we're generating knowledge or evidence or whatever we call it, it's almost um, there's almost an onus on us to start to promote that actively and see that as part of our role. And there are lots of opportunities. I just wanted to flag that um, Health Education England, um, libraries and NHS services, uh, obviously I suspect that it's helping them um, do it as well. There's evidence updates that we produce weekly, monthly, and we're actively looking for evidence for problems day to day. You know, that is something that we have a problem at the practitioner end. And so if you can, you know, put your hands up, you know, really proactively approach the design for what happens, they will promote your evidence for you. 
just need to think back who's the constituency, who's the customer for the, for the evidence that you're producing. You might be able to use it. They will then embrace it. And, you know, I'm one of the people, but there's a lot of uh, organisations out there that are looking at this. Would you mind just saying who you are so that people can find you? Um, and um, I work for Twitter and Twitter Trust, and I'm doing here as well. Um, but it is a really, really active problem. And we're partnering with Health Education Agency to tackle some of this. And so we've got a great idea about how to break that down. Great. So you have someone to nab afterwards yeah. in the conversation, and then question who's behind you. Yeah. Sorry, it's you with the glasses. Yeah. Yeah. It is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So my question is, is that example, for example, about obesity and about researching in my watches and versus researching potential factors like advertising for uh, unhealthy food? Uh, so the question is, uh, how does policy makers come up with these questions that they actually need to research advertising to just not yet research? You know, because that example implies there are no enough research. Great. So, so there's, there's some link questions. So thank you very much for your offer. A, a link question to the panel about that: uh, how, how to help local government, particular reach out. And there are there are some some websites and some um, Twitter feeds that might help on that, but broader. Um, to the community, to the research community, but, but any other thoughts on that would be great. And then I guess it's more actually got a really interesting question is about who, how do you end up with the questions we do from the from the policy making community, which make their way into the research questions? How does that process happen? Why do they end up the way they do? I've got somebody here desperately desperately trying to speak, so please do. Is this re related to this? Yes, I don't have a question, but I intended to introduce you to Edward. Now, who can you Can I just ask you to say your name again and where you're from? So, Joanna Hartland, again, another person to go now on the way out. So, so thank you very much for offering that. Yeah. Fantastic. So, if, it, if we haven't achieved anything today, it's actually to put you into contact with each other in this room. So, I think that's actually a really worthy thing to have done. But uh, sorry, to come back to the panel, any reflections on the on the point of the questions? So mine was a, quite a practical thought that just occurred to me that if I was a researcher, I think one of the things I and I, and I understood how the policy process happened, and I want I would go to the green paper advancing our health for all its faults and strengths, look at the consultation questions that were in there look at the when the when the consultation comes out because that helps to frame what they're doing and think are there things here that i can contribute to or are there things here that i ought to be looking to be that i might want to be interested in doing there, there, there are some big signals and symbols that gets put out there by government and i i'm not i'm i think i'm not sure they're always recognized for for what they're about by people working in academia and often in local government too uh, around it. Thank you. And, and certainly locally, um, the, the health, joint health and wellbeing strategy presumably helps focus um, where local government is, what its priorities are. Um, so, yes, so, so it, it is in Bristol, um, our health and wellbeing strategy embraces our one city plan, which I've already referred to, and our healthier together. Uh, which is the health and care system plan. So if you were looking at you know, what, what's the direction of travel for Bristol and uh, neighbouring areas, it would be there. I, I guess I'd just add <laughs> to my observation, actually, David, which is um, 
I, I think I've been quite um, challenged and reminded today how we all live in such different worlds. And that actually you're right. I mean, we've had all the discussion, but actually probably the most um, important thing, useful thing, is just all being in one room and making these connections. And maybe that's what we just need to do a little bit more um, in order to be on the boundary and be learning each other's languages. Because I think I would have made a lot of assumptions about everybody's understanding of local authority, what we have to do, the role of public health and local authority. And I realise that I maybe have to um, get out a bit more and explain that. <laughs> and you know where I am. <laughs> and are you also making the connections uh, between yourselves uh, at the university. So in terms of uh, identifying the research questions, so as I mentioned when I was speaking, I, I've just done a piece of work to, to literally identify what are gaps, key gaps in evidence and our sort of research priorities. And I'm using that information, so I do have a list, and I'm using that information to, to discuss it with uh, NIHR, with the MRC Population Sciences Board, uh, with, uh, within NIHR, I've done it with, uh, the, the, with the ARCs, with the, the School of Public Health, with the Health Protection Research Units. All those bits of NIHR infrastructure exist here at the university. So the question is, are you also you know, engaging yourselves with those bits of, of infrastructure here? Um, there are a, a lot of opportunities, uh, calls for funding, that go uh, you, you, where, where funding is not allocated. So in my last visit to the, uh, the public health um, uh, research program in Southampton, you know, the feedback that I got from NIHR is that in some areas they haven't had a single, they haven't funded a single piece of research. So that to me says, are we aligning the, uh, you know, the research that's being uh, done in universities to the priorities that, you know, are and should be coming up to the research funding bodies. In terms of your question around, uh, you know, migration, so uh, you've got your academic um, uh, supervisor, they might be able to signpost you, but in, if not normally, colleagues locally in PHE might be able to, to help with that kind of question. There are, so, uh, the, the, the finder bit on, on Twitter you can find is NIHR is, is useful and there are small pots of funding through NIHR and others for evaluation of this kind uh, which you know which can be used. I'm going, to, I'm going to come to you in a minute and just ask you know, one final sort of um, message or point you want to make to the audience on this on this question before. I thought yours, Christine, was, was great as it is. So if you want to add another one, brilliant. But I thought that was that that that, that was really good. Um, but I guess the thing we haven't talked, well, you've actually yet said, we have talked about because you've done it, was I guess actually going going and, and working in these places. There's, to me, there's no substitute for actually, if you get the opportunity and look for the opportunity to spend three months, six months, actually doing doing somebody else's job. And you might actually end up liking it, and you might end up, you know, so so I guess just take take some risks if you can. I mean, I don't know whether that's yeah. something that you would say. Or... I think that, yeah, that speaks to your point about, you know, we, at what? Again, I was very naive. I didn't know how policy making worked. I didn't know what policy makers did. And that's why going and working there was so useful. You, you can't you know, have a go come to one of these and understand how the whole process works. You only, well, from my perspective, you only really learn that by going and doing it for a little bit. And yeah, there's no substitute for that. Thank you. Anyone, any other final comments from the, from the panel or reflections? So something you said is to open up the question and answer session has prompted a thought in my head. So, um, we use this phrase sometimes that the evidence speaks for itself. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> it's, it's such an untrue phrase. Uh, and, and you talked about expertise and evidence, and I'm really interested that because intellectually they come from very different areas. Evidence has been heavily comes from this um, evidence-based medicine uh, approach to it. Um, expertise the study of what expertise is, is sits in very different academic disciplines and skills. But actually, a big part of the job is bringing together evidence and expertise. And I don't think we've talked en we talk enough about that. And, 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 it, and in doing, we get better at our thinking and vice versa. Thank you. Any other comments? In which case, I was going to say thank you very much to the panel, but also Lindsay in particular, 
Organising all the day. <laughs> well, I think many of the questions around where, how do I get not, where do I find this, who do I need to speak to, the reason we're here is because Lindsay and team have put on this event. So actually, we need to thank Lindsay and, and her and her team are sort of a really important part of this. But you put your hand up anyway. But, but I wanted to say that before we before I drew it to a close. But Lindsay, over to you. Thank you. Um, no, just that um, I was planning on sending out an email after the event around around us all um, and just signpost a few of the resources and. Uh, and things mentioned. Um, so if you would like to write a line in that um, with a request for making some new friends or, or, <laughs> or places where you think the evidence should be, like the news that I mentioned and things like that, do either grab me there now or drop me a line with Lindsay Quake. Um, so yeah, thanks. So thank you very much. Thanks to our panel with excellent conversation, let's say conversations. Thank you to you for some fantastic questions too. And I hope I hope you if one thing you do is you, you get to know each other a little bit better after this, then then it would have been worth all of our time. So thank you very much for coming today.